Okay, this is kind of loud, but we'll try to start from here. Um, my name is Amanda Van Dyke. Um, I'm a gemologist originally, and I worked in the diamond industry. I don't think that's going to help. <laughs> Do we want to see if we can hold on? Okay, I'll try to speak a little louder. Um, I worked in the diamond industry before I got an MBA and started a career in finance. And in my career in finance, I've only worked in the mining industry. I basically have raised money for the last seven or eight years just for mines around the world. Um, I also run an industry organization called Women in Mining that represents um, women who work within the mining industry. Uh, here, let's get through this. By the way, that's a risk and disclaimer, so you should ignore everything I say, of course. Um, uh, the purpose of Tom bringing me here today was to advise you on investing in the mining market um, from a slightly different perspective than, than is general, generally guys trying to sell you a mine. Sorry. Um, London's... Uh, <gasps> this is a very common expression that a, a mine is a hole in the ground owned by a liar. But realistically speaking, a mine is a business that extracts ore out of the ground. Um, and people often forget that when they're looking at mining companies. Um, sorry. A mine is first and foremost a business. Um, and people often forget that when they're looking at mining industries. It's not a geology project. When we invest in geology and geologists in the mining industry, we, we invest in them because they're a tool. Um, but from an investment point of view, you need to remember you're not looking for a science project. Can everyone hear me? Okay. You're not looking for a science project. You're looking for an economic business plan that happens to include a science project. <laughs> I don't care if a company has the biggest, highest grade discovery of ore on the planet. If that discovery is not accompanied by a reasonable economic and executable business plan to extract those minerals for a profit, I would never advise you to invest in it. Um, let's take a step back and sort of dis discuss why we invest in mining at all and why it's interesting. Um, every American born today will need three million pounds of minerals and metals in their lifetime. And every baby born outside of the U.S. ultimately wants to be a U.S. baby. <laughs> Um, the American commodity intensive lifestyle is the envy of the entire world and it's what the entire developing world is trying to catch up with. Um, there is a baseline demand for minerals that all modern humans need and no matter what for food and shelter um, and, and these days energy as well. Um, every increment above basic living standards requires more and more minerals. Every Every, every bit of economic development that, that humans achieve in their lifetimes is more mineral intensive or more mining intensive. It requires things that come out of the ground. And there is just absolutely no way to avoid that. Which is why, if we believe that the world is growing and people want to live more developed lifestyles, we invest in the mining industry because we think that's, it is an actual correlative way to invest in global growth. Now, I realize that most of you tend to look at uh, UK mining companies most often, but the world of mining is much, much bigger than that. <laughs> um, mining is the most global industry on the planet. There are mines in almost every country in the world, and the mining companies listed on almost every exchange on the planet. The approximate market capitalization of the mining companies on the eight major mining exchanges in the world is $2.5 trillion, and that was as of last year, uh, 2012. That doesn't include the vast number of unlisted mining companies. Um, and there are a huge number of unlisted mining companies. Um, it's relevant to note that Chinese listed companies tend to be state-owned enterprises. And, and Chinese listed companies, although they are actually a huge proportion of global mines, are very hard for the rest of the world to invest in. Now, when I'm looking at a mining company, I'm always looking at it in a global context. I'm asking myself, where does this company fit into the global mining market? And this slide is showing you where global gold projects were in 2012. Gold's a precious metal, so transport and infrastructure are not significant considerations the way they are for bulk miners. So gold mines around the world are actually directly comparable to one another. 
When I look at a gold project, I'm asking myself, how does this project stack up to the global average cost of production? It might be cheaper to mine in Ghana than in Canada, but the relative risk of investing my capital is lower in Canada. But when a miner in Canada says to me that he has cash costs of $900 an ounce, which is only around the 50th percentile of North American cash costs, I know that that is the 90th percentile of global costs, and that isn't acceptable. Whenever you're looking at a mining project, consider what its cash costs are on a global basis and whether or not it stacks up. The extracted approximate total worth of mine products in 2012 was $1.9 trillion, which means all the products sold in mines around the world were approximately $1.9 trillion. And you need to look at the general breakdown of where that revenue came from is. The single largest mine product in the world is actually coal, <laughs> both in terms of volume and value. Mining tends to be associated with metals, but in reality, metals as a group are a significantly smaller part of mining. A diversified mining portfolio should consider all mined products. Metals prices have been severely stressed over the last couple of years, but coal, cement, aggregates, and industrial minerals like potash and phosphate have actually been much, much more resilient. One of the reasons, that is less, one of the reasons for that is that the demand from them is much more stable and less sensitive to global GDP and changes and fluctuations in global output. In fact, ore demanded in the world has been fairly stable over the last 10 years and rising. It's predicted to be fairly stable overall for the next 20 years and stable and increasing. Now, demand does not go in a straight line like you're seeing here um, in reality, but you need to look beyond the short term and see a trend. If you're invested across the mining spectrum and in, com in good, diverse mining companies, you're far more likely to be able to profit from the stable increasing growth in global commodity demand. There are a lot of commodities to choose from. When looking at a commodity, it's important to consider how their end use is. Commodity demand is essentially based on demand and supply, and how much people need and how much is available in the ground, and how much does it cost to get it out of the ground. There are a few indicators you should look seriously at if you're investing in mining. Global demand follows global GDP. GDP is the total value of all the goods and services bought in the world, and the more stuff being bought and sold, the more metal demand. GDP growth globally has been down, but it's still over 7% in China, and on average globally, it is still growing. So although we had a blip in global GDP demand, it is on the rise now. And historically, back to the 1970s, commodity prices and commodity demand have always followed growing GDP. Now prices directly, a closer indicator sir, of global prices, is actually OECD output. Um, the OECD is an international economic organization of 34 countries founded in 1961 to stimulate economic progress and world trade. One of the ways it does that is by tracking the cumulative output or production within its member states. Global GDP makes up for the demand, but production or output, the guys paying hard dollars to buy raw materials to make their goods, they're the ones that set the prices. So if you're looking for an indication on prices and the trend, you can look up this trend anywhere you want by yourself. Last but not least, metals consumption is linked to population and urbanization. Analysts around the world will tell you about the number of people moving into cities, but when you move from the country to the city, you move away from producing the commodities to consuming them. The urbanization rate in the third world countries is directly related to significant marginal increases in the consumption of metals. Commodity prices are fundamentally driven by demand and supply. A lot of people think that supply is simply the amount of supply and how, of a product that is available in the ground. That's absolutely incorrect. Supply is a combination of the amount in the ground and our capacity to get it out of the ground. <laughs> if we need more iron ore, we don't just need to consider how much iron ore there is in the world. And there's a lot of iron ore. It's one of the most plentiful products on the planet. Um, we also need to consider the amount of time and money it takes to get that supply out of the ground, and that includes capex and infrastructure, which is why iron ore prices have been increasing over the last couple of years, despite a plentiful supply of iron ore. When emerging markets grow, grow out of steel-intensive use, demand will go down for iron ore, and prices might as well. In the long term, we're talking 10 to 20 year cycles, the price of a commodity is generally 
the average cost of producing it. One of the, I don't know how many of you were at the gold thing earlier, but they were asking for a, a, a basement in terms of what's the lowest price gold can go to. The average all-in cost of gold production in the world right now is $12.50. So there's cash costs and all-in costs. And although it might drip slightly below $150 and it's dropped to about $17.80, largely speaking, prices cannot remain below the cost, of, the cost of producing the thing for a very long period of time. So if you are looking for a general basement in the price of any metal, on average, usually, with, with a few exceptions, if you look for the all-in global cost of average cost of production, that's usually around where your basement's going to be. And in gold, it's $12.50 right now. Additionally, it's relevant to note that during different stages of economic development, different commodities are more or less in demand. Early stage development, roads, rail, buildings, manufacturing plants, they require steel and coal. And you need to be pretty wealthy, though, before you start needing chrome-plated fixtures and diamond rings. So when you're looking, if you're trying to predict global demand for different kinds of commodities, look at where in the global growth cycle we are. If you guys want to ask a question in between, feel free to sort of pop up your hand. I don't mind answering them. Of course you do, Dominic. Um, the, uh, the global cost of production of a metal, it, it obviously matters for something like copper that's consumed. With something like gold that never gets consumed, how much does the actual cost of production matter? Um, Did everyone hear that? Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, gold's not a regular commodity. It's not consumed. <laughs> Gold is controlled by supply and demand to some extent, and the average cost of production counts as a basement. So obviously people can't produce, continue producing and selling gold at less at the cost of making it, or else they're just going to close down their mine. Um, but demand for gold is generally is a store of wealth. And, and so when the stuff I said earlier doesn't really relate to gold, when trying to forecast gold pricing, you need to look at other financial factors. But I'm not going to lecture you on all of those. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, I will answer questions on it later if you want. But generally speaking, you, you always have to consider gold different from regular commodities. Um, I am a gold bug, just in case you're wondering. I believe long term in higher gold prices. So gold is, the gold is theoretically the real value of money. And how you determine the real value of money I personally, and this is just how I calculate it, lots of people use lots of different ways of calculating the gold price. I use the Irving Fisher equation. I've seen a lot of guys talk about the amount of money the Fed is printing, but I've not seen one of them talk about how quickly that money is being turned over in the economy. I watch economic indicators, um, and I don't feel that the price of gold will significantly increase until the velocity of money increases. And the velocity of money is something that we can all watch. But that being said, the price of gold on its own requires turning over in the economy before it goes up. So all the money printed is one thing. But until that money starts multiplying, you won't see inflation and you won't see an increase in the gold price. That being said, inflation is rising, velocity is rising. So everything is indicated that the trend for the increase in gold prices has begun and started around the beginning of this year. Now back to regular mining. <laughs> The general market looks at four major sections, large cap, mid cap, small cap, and micro cap. Mid and large cap are generally producers and are never going to give you multiples on your money. <laughs> um, but they will pay you dividends, which I'm sure a few of you like. <laughs> and they're far less risky. I'm personally a big fan of Rand Gold um, in the producer category. Small caps and micro caps give you the best leverage, but they also have the most risk associated with them. This is a breakdown of estimated number of mining projects in the world in 2012. Only 10% of those are operating mines, and that's really relevant to note. <laughs> um, and 8% are at the feasibility or construction stage. So 8% of these mines, only 18% we know are going to be a mine one day. 82%, the vast majority, are very early stage. And given the number of actual producing mines in the world, you should be able to do one very, very important fact. Very, very few exploration projects ever become mines. Um, 
If you invest in a pure exploration play, you might get a 20 bagger. You might make 20 times your money. You might make 50 times your money if you're really lucky. But you are far, far more likely to make absolutely nothing. <laughs> the risk of making 20 times your money is, equal, is, is inverse to the risk of losing all your money. So when you're investing in small cap exploration stocks, you really need to remember that fact. <laughs> Unless you're a geologist and you have the tools to figure out which exploration projects have promise, you probably shouldn't be investing in exploration projects. Once you're in an advanced drilling stage, you can probably start to apply economics and probability to a project, and then you can make an investment decision, which is, I assume, what most of you are trying to do. Every mining company, no matter how big or small, is made up of at least one or many projects that follow a very, very defined life cycle. You start with exploration, you drill, you define a resource, you apply economics, you plan a mine, you permit a mine, you finance a mine, then you build it, and then finally, at the end of that, you start producing. The reality is, this process, getting to production, can take anywhere between five and 10 years. So you need to be prepared when you're investing in early stage mining companies to understand that they won't be hitting production and you won't be getting a reasonable NPV or return on your investment until those mines are in production. And the line is not as easy as this in reality. It'll go up and it won't go into that pattern in, in a straight line. It'll go up and down and vary as it goes through that. So your question is generally, what are the best times to invest? Um, this, uh, this presentation will be on Tom's website. He generally puts it up afterwards. So you, can, you don't have to sort of take notes and pictures. You can get the whole thing. Your question is, when are the best times to invest? The sweet spot is post-discovery at the PEA. Um, when you have a resource, when you know how much ore you have in the ground, and you have the tools to apply general economics to that. So you have the ability to, to on a desktop basis, decide whether or not there is a likelihood that those minerals can be exploited at a, at a reasonable cost. And how big could the resource be? The initial discovery is the best time to jump on the bag wagon. You need to make a quick call and jump, and if you miss it, the next best time to jump on is when they're starting their feasibility study. You'll make less money, but you'll take far less risk. So those are my general sort of when you should jump on. Sometime around discovery and then at feasibility. Those are, or, or when they're starting feasibility, because then you're on upward trends. Jumping on the bandwagon after everybody else is not generally a good idea. And there's always another mining company to invest in if you're worried. <laughs> One thing we haven't talked about is economics. And how you, in, and we, you don't invest in geology as we discussed earlier. You invest in economic geology. Resources and reserves are that difference between geology and economic geology. An inferred resource is geology. It's a confirmation that you have minerals in the ground. An indicated and measured is just means you have enough drill holes to be sure of how much you have in the ground. But a reserve, okay, is when you've applied economics to something. The SEC actually only accepts reserves into its reporting. To determine if a mineral resource is economic, you need to consider engineering and how much of a deposit is economically mineable, and metallurgy. It's great to have a million ounces in the ground, but if only 50% of that metal is recoverable, then you only really have 500,000 ounces. So recoverability of metal is essential. The second thing you need to consider is economics in terms of what kind of a margin can you expect to make on a mine? How much will it cost to build and what is the internal rate of return? You also need to consider the market. How, how much in demand is this particular metal right now? The environment, can you get these minerals out of the ground without seriously affecting the flora and fauna? Social and government, do they want to mine next door? Um, they're trying right now to build, you know, to get oil out of the ground in the UK. And they're trying to get, and fracking and all of that stuff and build one of the world's largest potash mines in the UK. But realistically, we all know that it's not that easy, it's not going to be that easy to permit it. And the reality is it's not that easy to permit anywhere in the world anymore. So 
making a political and social call on whether or not a mine can be permitted is an essential part of deciding whether or not you invest in that mine. Key considerations, production, capital cost, how much is it cost going to be to build a cost, sustaining capital costs, how much, is it, how much are you going to have to keep pouring into the mine to be able to, to keep it into production over time, operating costs or cash costs, uh, how much does it cost to continually mine those things out of the ground after you've built all your facilities, royalties, taxes, debt and offtakes. There's a lot of financial instruments that need to be serviced to build a mine and, and to keep a mine going. All-in costs are basically adding up all of the costs you have, not just the cash costs, your G&A, your taxes, royalties, financing costs, and all of that. And then you have an actual margin. Um, you need to consider all of these factors when you're looking at every mine. So how do you value and explore a developer? NPV, net present value. Um, that being said, when I say NPV for an explorer developer, you consider, you calculate the NPV, the net present value, but then you discount it. You look at the entire market of mining companies and say, what is the average discount for a mine at this level? So if an average explorer is being discounted 70%, then take the NPV and minus 70%. And then you have a reasonable cost of what your mine should be worth. The most common thing is comparable value per ounce in the ground when it comes to gold companies. So that's a really easy way to compare companies. And you want to buy things that are comparable. Internal rate of return, how much, are you, how much money are you going to get back on this thing? Uh, a general rule of thumb is grassroots projects, one in a hundred grassroots projects become a mine one day. Once they start drilling, one in 10. And once they're at PEA, one in five. So when you're investing in early stage mines, remember how many of them are never actually going to be a mine. Seven deadly sins in mining are the risks. And these are what stop projects from becoming mines. ESG risk, environmental social governance. They've stopped more mines in their tracks in the last 10 years than anything else, any other single factor. You have to be able to permit something, and if you can't permit it, get in, in the modern context, whether you're in Ghana or whether you're in the UK, you're not gonna be a mine. Execution, do you have a, do you have a management team that can actually build a mine? Not all people do. Financing risk is huge. Nobody builds a mine with pure equity anymore. You have to be able to get a bank to lend you the money. And in bad economic times, no banks are lending money unless you have a really good project. So you have to consider whether or not something's financeable. Operating risk um, and country risk are, are closely related. What are the chances you can keep your operations running? Market risk is two things. Are you going to be able to continue? Is the commodity going to maintain its price in the market? And is the market investing in mining products right now? Both of them matter. And where we are in, in, in the commodity prices as a market and where we are in the mining market as, as investments in stocks matter. So always consider where the market's at when you're investing. And the last is resource risk. Um, we discussed that a bit earlier. Just because you have a big pile of metal in the ground doesn't mean that metal is going to be economically recoverable. And the more work you do on a, on a big pile of metal in the ground, the more you find out isn't recoverable. <laughs> so always consider that. Um, something new that's happened in the mining world, that when you've been looking at mines, you, you just looked at margins, and that's all very, very important. But as I said earlier, um, what stopped mines in their trap Investors and financiers have traditionally cared about margins, as they should, as you should. Because unless something's going to make money, unless something's a sustainable business, you shouldn't be investing in it. But these days, a good mining company isn't the only thing that matters. Everybody has an opinion on a mine these days. Does the community want that mine in their backyard? 
can you build that mine without killing everything around it in a way that's sustainable? And does that government want a mine? And is it willing to permit your mine in a timely manner? Um, these days, all of those considerations need to be considered when you're investing in a mine. Sorry, one sec. Key factors that I always consider when I'm looking at a mining company, management track record. Um, and some of these were discussed earlier. This is just my personal opinion, but I have seen more beautiful deposits ruined by a bad management team than I have seen. And I have seen very, very average deposits that go into production, make great profits, and pay their investors back with great management teams. In my opinion, the most important factor is not geology. The most important factor, I mean, it, it plays a part. You have to have a decent deposit. But in my honest opinion, when you're looking at a mining company, looking at the track record of the key management is the most essential part of finding out whether that mine's gonna go into production and make a profit for you. Because if they've done it before, there's a good chance they'll do it again. This came up earlier with Richard, management skin in the game. How much of their own money does the management have tied up in this? It's a key incentive to making a mine work. Um, and like Richard said earlier, 3% isn't enough. I'd say at an early stage, like before it goes into production, I'd like to see management owning a minimum of 5%, up to 10%. That's how you know that they're going to make that mine work, when they have no choice but to make that mine work. Um, General market conditions are, are very important, unfortunately. Good management, good mine. If the market sucks, the market sucks. I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, you can buy low, but assume that you might have to wait. In any individual mine, looking at the, you can find global demand forecasts for any given commodity, and you can make your own choice. But you really can, it's not impossible. There's a general consensus on the demand for any given commodity. And before you invest in a mine, figure out whether or not that commodity has rising average or stable demand over the next five or 10 years, because that's going to determine whether or not that mine is successful. Jurisdiction. <laughs> um, we discussed earlier on the panel, South Africa is a scary jurisdiction. Um, Zimbabwe is a scary jurisdiction. You can make a lot of money in scary jurisdictions, but as we also saw earlier, there are mines on almost every country on the planet. <laughs> you can invest anywhere. So if you can invest anywhere in a mining project, you're probably slightly better off investing in a country that has a track record of permitting mining projects, has a track record of letting people invest in mining projects, and isn't talking about nationalizing your mines. That's my, and increasing your taxes. Both nationalization and taxation are both ways where profits are taken away from investors, and you need to pay attention to the rhetoric. Environmental social governance that we all discussed earlier, is this thing going to be permittable? Is it a socially, environmentally acceptable mine? And then governance is the little G that's tacked on there that people always forget. Do you have a board of guys? Are they running this mine? Are they governing themselves in an appropriate business-like manner? Do they have a track record of governing themselves in an appropriate business-like manner? It matters. Do they? And the last and least, but also probably most important, is your margin. Before we consider any of these other factors, there's one big huge elephant in the room. Gold is sitting, at, gold's the easiest thing to compare. Gold's sitting at around $1,300 right now. If the all-in cost of production on a certain mine is $1,250, you're only making 50 bucks an ounce. You want to invest in the companies that have the highest margins. End of discussion. As a rule of thumb, if their margins aren't in the lower, like if they're, if their costs aren't in the lower 50% of the world, don't bother investing. Rule of thumb, 
you want to have the higher 50% of the margins in the world. It's just that easy. And then you apply all the other risk factors to it and make your investment decision. So how you choose where you're going to invest? Explorers, developers, producers, major diversified miners, or funds, which is a good way to invest, actually. This should be based on your risk appetite. Determine how much risk you want to take and invest accordingly. Choose the commodities that you believe in. Choose a portfolio approach. So don't ever invest in one mining company. It's not in your interests. If you can't afford to invest in 10 mining companies, you probably shouldn't be investing in them. You need to have a diversified portfolio. You need to pick good portfolios. And occasionally, you need to pick, if you can't do that, the easiest way to invest is to invest in a mining fund. So do your homework, ask hard questions, and don't invest until you have all the answers. That's it. Who has questions? Does anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, now, all in costs of production about five years ago, five or six years ago, were, um, was approximately, I think, 900. Um, there was huge cost inflation in the gold space, inflation on, on general costs in the gold space, it, and it came from a lot of places. Basically, they were making more money, so everybody started charging more. And, and global grades went down. It's gotten a lot more expensive to get an ounce of gold out of the ground. Um, they were at the height, I think they were around 1300 or 1350. They've come back down to around 1250. Um, they will go up again as prices go up. But the prices are, they go up very, very quickly. They come down very, very slowly when it comes to costs, <laughs> is the general rule. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying that gold can't go down to 900. It can. I'd be lying if I said it can't. It's gone down before. But if it goes down to 900, 50% of the gold mines, more than 50% of the gold mines in the world are closing down. You can't produce at a loss. You can produce at a loss for a few months, six months even, maybe. But nobody's going to keep a mine open if you're paying more money to get it out of the ground. And, and, and that's the point. The sticky point, like, so if, 50, if, if gold went down to 900, I'd say at least 50% of the gold mines in the world have to close down. If 50% of the gold mines in the world close down, then there's a, prices go up, <laughs> right? No. I mean, there are guys out there. I mean, we say a lot of crappy things about Barrick, but Barrick has, has mines that have cash costs around 300 bucks an ounce and all-in costs around 500. There are mines out there, some of the big miners have old mines that are making a ton of money. So when I say 1250, that's an average. There are guys that are producing at a loss right now. That you know, they have 14, 1500 dollar prices and their investors are pouring more money in on the hope that the gold price will go up. They can't do it forever, but they can do it for a little while. The price did go down. It went down to 1780. Or sorry, 11 it was 1180, didn't, isn't that what it went down to? Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. All the guys who are producing economically will continue producing, and the guys long term who are producing non economically will ultimately close. They make a decision within six months, they'll close. Sorry, I can't hear you. Big mining concern like BNT, Billiton. Yes. Do they have a range of mines where some are at the low end and some are at the high end? Yes, absolutely. Um, his question was big mines like BHT, BHP, who have many mines across the spectrum, do they have lower end and higher end mines? They do. I heard an interesting statistic the other day, though, that um, 
the top 20 producing mines in BHP are actually their smaller mines, not their larger mines. Um, the, a, a global diversified miner has some guys that are making huge margins and some guys that are making small margins and they average it all out. And you know, some commodities that are doing well and some commodities that aren't. That's, that's what you get and that's why their prices are a lot stickier because you get the same kind of diversification you get in a mining fund in a diversified miner. Any other questions? I'm really curious. Sorry, my question was in regards to the finance positions on the hedging. Mm -hmm. So in the treasury miners, I mean, how much does that affect your um, investment decision long term? Right? So for some miners, for example, so for example, the peak of the gold price, they would have been some miners that fix the prices uh, for whatever reason, and other other companies and you guys are also left through to less. Mm -hmm. Does that affect your know, investment decision? Do you look at that? Um, yeah, his question is about hedging and should you invest in a company that's hedged? So a hedged company has pre-sold its production at a set price. So there's no, and the reason that you'd look at that is there's no growth in price. In a if a company has pre-sold its production, that means that they're always only going to get a certain price for it. So you know how much money they're going to make, so you can make your forecast on how much, whether or not you should invest in it but you don't get any access to growth in commodity prices because they won't make it. And that all, de if they're making an acceptable amount of money, there's no reason not to invest in a hedged company. If you're trying to get leverage to an increasing price, if that's the reason you're investing, you want to invest in, you want to be leveraged to price increases, then don't invest in a hedged company. Anything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a great way to get in. Um, there's a few. I think Anglo Pacific, a, a, a London listed company worth looking at is Anglo Pacific. Um, they are they invest in royalties. Um, does everybody here know what a royalty is? Okay, a royalty, there's a lot of ways to finance a mine. One of the ways to finance a mine is to take a royalty. So if a mine needs, let's say, $100 mil million, it'll borrow $100 million from a royalty company, and they take 2% of their production or 5% of their production for the life of mine. And if a price goes up, they're going to make more money. So they'll always get a set percentage of that mine's production. So they're buying in advance a percentage of the production. Um, and rather than investing in a mine itself, a lot of people like investing in that percentage of production because then they know they're getting a certain amount. And in, when miners are doing badly, investing in these alternative finance products can be a very good way to invest in the mining sector. Um, and you'll get leverage to increasing, and you also get leverage to an increasing price in that way as well. You won't ever make as much money as investing in a pure mine, but you won't lose as much money either. Um, he asked my opinion on African Barrick Gold and the fact that their share price has gone up a lot since the summer, as well as the security issues at African Barrick. Um, generally speaking, African Barrick has not historically been, or the Boolean Hulu mine has not historically been a very well-run mine. Um, they undertook over the summer some serious reorganization, like corporate internal reorganization, and on the whole, they've reorganized themselves to be a much more economic mine, and they have incredible grades. Um, I think their reorganization is sound, so they're not bad from that point of view. I don't know if they have a lot more to go, but they have reorganized themselves into a viable mining company. Um, Tanzania and Boolean Hulu has always had security problems, and there's always been social issues with Tanzania. And it's one of the jurisdictional risks of Tanzania. African Barrick has actually built a big wall around their compound. It is not my opinion that a big wall is ever a good solution to a problem. <laughs> but that was African Barrick's issue. Um, just assume that Tanzania has a huge, artisanal, huge number of artisanal miners and a huge number of problems and that 
those problems are likely to continue. I see no reason why they would abate. And, and just, I, just add a little bit more risk. Like it, it's part of the risk discount for I investing in African Barrick is that they have security issues in Tanzania. They want it more. They want it a lot more. West Africa knows that mining is one of the only ways that they're going to get foreign exchange. Um, a South Africa, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of good gold mines in in West Africa, and there's a lot of ounces in the ground that are economically mineable. So one, the the gold mining industry in South Africa is really old, really deep, and really difficult. And on top of it, the people in South Africa, they have huge unions and they're, they're almost anti-mining. Um, and they, there's been huge talk about nationalization and, and going, like, they're literally talking to Zimbabwe. And I mean, we all know what happened in Zimbabwe. But, you know, politically, they're very aligned with Zimbabwe. Um, that's a scary place to invest. As I said, there's a lot of places in the world to invest. Places like West Africa, where they actively want mining investment and they are really keen to have foreigners come in and build mines and start paying them for an exchange. Why wouldn't you invest in a place where they want you to be rather than a place where they're just trying to tax you and take over your mine? Hmm? Well, I mean, Ghana has been mined for a while. There's some, mi there's, but still, relatively speaking, they started mining gold around the, like in the 1800s in South Africa, right? They, as they did in Nevada and stuff. And there is residual but lower grade production there. Um, but West Africa is a lot bigger than that. I mean, Cote d'Ivoire is looking, I have to admit, is looking great. Yeah. Ghana has been mined longer, so. The, the easiest stuff to find in Ghana has probably been found. I still think there's a lot of good new stuff to be found in other places. Mali, um, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, they're all really good regions in West Africa to be looking at right now. Anything else? Okay, we're all done. Um, their average cast, co okay. All in costs are dependent on the country, taxes, all those other things. Um, but I think the average cost, of, cash cost of production in West Africa right now is around $700 an ounce. $700 for cash, which means just their operating costs.